There are various versions of lithium isotopes, they're called. And the one that was needed for this weapon was lithium-6. It had three protons, three neutrons, lithium-6. The fuel mixture, known as lithium deuteride, was packed inside this aluminum cylinder. Bikini was about to witness the most powerful explosion ever staged by the United States, codename Castle Bravo. But this time, things would get dramatically out of control. They tested the bomb with liquid hydrogen, but they never tested one with lithium deuteride. And the measurements had been made wrong, as it turned out. Almost 60 years ago, John R. Holderman was a young Marine corporal. Shipped out to the Pacific for this top secret mission, he stood guard over America's super bomb. It looked like a big propane tank, about five feet in diameter, 20 feet long. I wrote my name on it, being smart, signed it. But we had to stay with that until it was all set up to go off. And you weren't allowed on there. If your name wasn't on the access list, you had orders to shoot to kill. Bikini Atoll is a ring of small islands. Holderman stood guard in the northwest corner where Bravo would actually detonate. But it would be triggered from the island of Enyu, 20 miles away. What happened next is documented in this once classified film. Starting at H minus 48 hours, all personnel at Bikini Atoll were evacuated. The only men to remain were the members of the firing party, protected in their bunker on Enyu Island. The bunker is located just beside the island's landing strip. It meant that if things went wrong, they would call in a helicopter for rescue. But the men inside here felt safe. Protected not just by reinforced concrete, but massive blast doors. Their job was to ensure that all monitoring devices were running. And finally, priming the firing circuit itself. If the scientists' calculations were correct, the lithium deuteride mixture would erupt with the force of five million tons of TNT. Oh, good, I'm fine. If it went much higher, or the force were any greater, the 20-mile margin of safety might not be enough. Their bunker was even made watertight, in case Bravo unleashed a tidal wave. As zero hour approached, Marine John Holderman was aboard the USS Curtis, the ship carrying top brass and scientists, as it had for Operation Mike two years before. We were 23 miles from ground zero. And they're starting a countdown. And uh, if they got down to 10 seconds, then, then you, can, you get kind of goose pimples and your hair stands up on the back of you. had dark goggles on, but when it went off, you can see the bone in your arm. It's like looking at an x-ray. When we did turn around and take our goggles off, we all thought it'd be off in the distance. It was right on top of us. And you could see the shock wave coming, like a miniature tidal wave or tsunami. You're grabbing hold of lifelines and hanging on to gun mounts and guys are sliding across the deck and you're grabbing them. 
and then it tilted back the other way, and I turned around to my buddy, and I said, hey, I think we're gone. He said, yeah, I think you're right. It was a terrifying moment. The explosion reached out so close to the blockhouses that they barely got out alive. The leader of the firing party, Dr. John C. Clark, later gave a moment-by-moment -moment account of what happened. At zero plus 20 seconds, a shock like a giant earthquake. At zero plus 90 seconds, the air blast. So powerful that the concrete walls creaked. But it was their Geiger counters measuring radiation that caused the most fear. Bravo had created a vast plume of radioactive fallout, far bigger than expected and heading in a direction no one had predicted. Fallout in a nuclear weapon is more a product of the material that's churned up by the explosion than it is of the explosion itself. The explosion is so hot that it just basically turns everything in the bomb into a gas. A bomb that's exploded on the ground stirs up the earth and irradiates the elements in those materials. And then that material is intensely radioactive and its radioactivity is what typically we call fallout. Inside the bunker, radiation levels continued to rise. Clark reassured his team that a helicopter would soon be on the way, but they would still need to reach the landing pad. The helicopter blades would kick up fallout which had already settled, making it even more dangerous since no one in the bunker had been issued protective clothing. Get the bed sheets. Get that one, get that one, get this one. And so Clark devised a primitive solution. These men who just set off the most potent weapon in history would shield themselves with bed sheets. You ready? I think I'm good. All right. Let's go. Let's go see how it As they hurried toward the waiting chopper. The USS Curtis, 23 miles from ground zero, was now also in harm's way. We were the closest ship to the blast. And that radioactive dust, it's like snow. They just ordered us below deck, and we went below deck and buttoned up. They came around with Geiger counters, and the Geiger counter would sing when they bring it around your body. I must have been down there 10 days. It stunk down there. It got really ripe. And if anybody went out of the, the hatches, you, you had orders to shoot them. So what had gone wrong? Although the principle of the hydrogen bomb had been proved with Operation Mike, each new weapon was pushing science to its limit.
And if you hear it, as you drive in your auto, as you sit in your office, or work at your bench, wherever you are, what will you do? What will happen to you? Arthur, let me tip your hat back so we can get a good view of you as I ask a very personal question. How old are you? My next birthday, I'll be 65. Sorry to say. <laughs> that makes you the oldest and yet really the youngest from what we've observed here, inhabitant of our trench so close to ground zero. Arthur, there's a charming lady right behind yes, you. Would sir. you mind if we talk with her, too? I'd like to get a little feminine reaction here, too. Now, this is Helen Lanninger from New York City. Helen, how long have you been waiting now? Oh, for about eight days. Eight, nine days. Nine days, yes. Right. Well, Grant, I guess we'd better get back up to Media Hill and see what's going on and how close to eight hour we really are. Well, here on Media Hill, Roy, the big story, as far as we can determine from looking out there, is the civil defense story, as well as that story of the military in the armored vehicles, the tanks and the personnel carriers. Now, Roy, uh, once again, I want to call you in so we can take a look at our split-screen arrangement that we have here. Not only our cameras here on Media Hill, but the camera that you have down in the tent. So come in on that split screen. In just a few seconds now, you'll see me assume this position. Matter of fact, there's our cue now. Everybody down, get down in the position. I'm going to shield my eyes against flying debris, pull my helmet down on the nape of my neck so that we don't get too many flying rocks. All right, uh, good luck, Roy. Now, let me explain something about this screen. This screen across the bottom of the section that I am will represent one mile on your camera. The top part, two miles. We're going to switch to another camera. I'm going to move out of here. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. The shockwave will arrive in the control point area in approximately half a minute. 